Hi, I'm Chris King and I'm going to be reading from John chapter 12 verses 1 to 18 and I'm reading from the New International Version. Um, the dogs will probably not actually read anything this morning. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was amongst those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he, was used to help, used, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was meant that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your King is coming seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him had continued to spread the word that he had called Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. And I'm just going to pray for Jody, who's going to be speaking to us this morning. But I just wanted to um, say, um, I just wanted to honour Jody and uh, say how grateful I am to God for her and um, for what she's put into my life, but into the lives of many people across Restore. And uh, she's a good friend um, and she is a trustworthy person. And so I'm really looking forward to hear what she's got to say this morning. Lord, thank you for Jodie. Thank you for um, her ability to teach the word in a way that we can all understand. And Father, I just want to pray now for her, for an anointing of your Holy Spirit to fill her, to overflowing, Lord. I pray that um, she would think clearly, she would speak clearly. And Father, we pray that our hearts would be open to you. Lord, we want to hear your word. We want to hear what it is that you are wanting to speak into our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, Jody. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for the prayer as well. Always appreciated. Um, and you are a good friend to me as well. Um, so good morning, everyone. As Hannah and Sammy uh, introduced us this morning in our family time, it is indeed Holy Week this week. And uh, we ha are starting kind of a, a mini, mini series for Easter, just today and then Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And we've called it How Sweet the Sound. How sweet the sound. And we've got this beautiful graphic there. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, a beautiful graphic. And uh, also a huge thanks to Richard and Rob for the lighting and just the, the set, as always, just, just capturing the heart. Um, but we've called it How Sweet the Sound. And it's, you may recognize that phrasing. It comes from the song Amazing Grace. So those opening lines, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 
And um, so we're, we're going to be focusing on kind of the sounds of Easter. It's a story some of us know really well and some of us don't. And we're looking today and, and Good Friday and Easter Sunday, at some of the sounds, some of the things said and heard on those days and what they meant uh, for the people then, but also for us now. And uh, we, uh, just to give you a bit of background on the story Amazing Grace, I don't know if you know much about it, um, there's a guy called John Newton who wrote it, and he was born in 1725, so it's not, pr it's not that recent. Uh, it's a pretty famous song, and most people know it. They've probably sung it at a wedding or a funeral or heard it on telly. It's sung nu it's numerous performances every year all around the world. And so Amazing Grace was written by this guy, John Newton, um, who was born in 1725. And he uh, worked on a ship and he was hated by all his shipmates, basically. Um, he was not very nice. Uh, he used very bad language. He was wild, he was a drunk, and he was violent. Um, so not someone you probably want to work with. And his language, um, he probably was, maybe this phrase was named after him, but he, you know, he had language like a sailor, you know, swore like a sailor. <laughs> and in fact, his captain um, said this of John, and John said this um, when he wrote it, he said, not only did he use the worst language I've ever, ever heard, but he created new words that exceeded the limits of verbal debauchery. That, <laughs> so that's taking it to a whole nother level. This was a guy, um, he used to, uh, you know, say bad stuff about God as well. And he was so hated that one time, when he actually, this is not funny, I don't know why, I'm, when he fell overboard, his, his shipmates did not throw him the, the life preserver thing, the life ring. They actually ha tried to harpoon him instead. So that's, how, that's kind of the relationship he had with those. Um, and he was so arrogant. And, he, and the captain one time just wanted to give him a telling off. So he, he made him kind of stripped down and was flogged, I think, 350 times or something like that. And John was so angry that he wanted to murder the captain and some of the crew. He was so angry that he made a plan to do that. And then this big storm blew up as he was kind of wanting to execute his plan. Before he could do that, this big storm blew up and hit the ship. And everyone thought they were going to die. And his best friend, who was right by him, sure enough, did go overboard and die and never seen again, but there's John, he's is in this moment, he thinks his life is over, and he finds himself calling on the God that he had raged against. He found himself crying out to God that this would, in his moment of greatest desperation, that God would do something, and he called on that God he'd been hating, and so, you know what? <laughs> John lived. He lived to tell the tale. And it made him wonder, I wonder if there's something more out there. And so he started to read the scriptures. He started to read the Bible. And what happened from that moment on is that his heart got transformed and his life got transformed by the grace of God. And so in 1772, he's put his pen to paper and he wrote the song, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. And I don't know if you knew that story or not, but it adds such a weight to those words that as we kind of sing kind of choruses of it um, over this coming week, just remembering that grace of God, how sweet the sound. And I think that runs throughout Easter, the Holy Week, this sound of grace. And so here we are on Palm Sunday, all these years later. Uh, we're here, Palm Sunday 2021. Now, after my efforts at craft last week, I decided not to make the, the palm hand. So I just brought um, my palm from home. <laughs> I just brought it. And uh, that's my effort. I'm not going to try craft again. I'm just going to bring in plants. There you go. So that's my palm for Palm Sunday, everybody. Uh, <laughs> but so here we are at Palm Sunday. And um, thank you again, Chris, for the reading. And we had this story of the triumphal entry. Now, entries are really important, and I found out this week that sometimes when we see um, people of 
note um, in the who we see in the news, so maybe politicians or such like, sometimes when they're, they're walking in and you catch them on the news, they're walking into a building for a big meeting, sometimes that is reshot. Did you know that? Sometimes because they don't want to look like they don't carry strength and poise and know what they're doing. And so if their walk-in isn't that great, it might get reshot changes it but entries are really important entries are so important so we've got this triumphal entry and on one hand this triumphal entry of Jesus looks like all other triumphal entries that's ever happened before so 200 before years before Jesus uh, Simon Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem on a horse in a triumphal entry uh, he had defeated the foreign armies and kept Israel independent. And as he rode into Jerusalem, there were people shouting and cheering and waving palms, just like Jesus' triumphal entry. So it wasn't an unfamiliar sight to, to the people of Israel, to the people of Jerusalem, to have someone ride into Jerusalem on a tr in a triumphal manner. And so on one hand, it looks just like that, welcoming in a conquering king, a hero to come and save but I want us to listen a little bit closer and, and look a little bit closer because I think there's something really interesting that, that God wants to, Jesus wants to tell us about him but also wants to tell us about us. And so in these verses, this verse in John 12, 13, it says, they took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Blessed is the King of Israel. And like Stuart said and Hannah and Sammy have said, people were cheering and shouting and, and you know, saying, Hosanna! And Hosanna just means save us or save now. They're saying, save us, save now. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he. And you can imagine, I don't know if you remember what being in a crowd was like, it's so long ago, but you can imagine the celebration and the excitement and the cheers and, you know, this is someone they've been waiting for, a triumphal entry of the one who's going to save them. And they're recognising it and they're, they're quoting scripture over him, going, blessed is he who comes. And they're waving, waving. And that next verse says that Jesus had found a young donkey and rode in on that. Now I've got a picture of a, a young donkey for you. Um, I'm not ashamed to admit I looked at quite a few donkey pictures. Um, they are very cute. If you ever just need a little bit of a, a happiness moment, I recommend looking up pictures of young donkeys. They're so cute. Um, but I don't think Jesus did it because it was cute, although it did have, you know, that photo op moment that maybe a politician would like. But he, he had, so apart from being cute and maybe slightly comical, um, to see this grown man ride in on a young donkey, it kind of looks like all other triumphal entries that have happened before. But it doesn't. Because victors don't ride in from battle into the capital cities riding on donkeys. They would normally ride in on magnificent horses, showing their strength and their power and, and triumphing through a force of arms. And there's a significance here. If he was coming as a, a military leader or a political leader, that's what it would have looked like. People only travel kind of on a donkey town to town if they were coming in peace. And Jesus deliberately chose a baby donkey, a young donkey. And like I said, it's kind of comical in a way, but it's actually really significant. Why would he do that? It's very deliberate. And it, like it says, when you read that passage, it it's fulfills scripture. It fulfills the prophecy of the king coming in on a donkey. But it's not only that. Why would this great saviour, this great messiah, this great king come in so gentle? And I think he's telling us something about him and he's telling us something about us. It says he's coming in to save us. Hosanna, he's coming to save. To save us, to save us now. But he's not going to do it by taking power. He's going to do it by losing power. He's not going to do it by killing. He's going to do it by dying. And he's not going to do it through force of strength. He's going to do it 
by weakness. What the people were expecting and what they actually needed was totally different. And it tells us something about this upside down, topsy-turvy understanding of what we call salvation. Now that's just a big fancy word really for us getting right with God, being made right with our, our Father in heaven, the one who created us, reconciling us to him, rescuing us from the stuff that separates us from him and making us right with him. So when I'm using the word salvation over the rest of this talk, it's, it's about making us right with God, reconciling us to him, rescuing us from certain death. And it shows we're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by what we do and we don't do. But we're saved by a saviour who comes in peace and gently and in weakness, in humility. He doesn't say, come, look at my power. Look how great I am. Look how moral I am. Look how upstanding I am. Look how great I am. Now, if you're like me, you can get to heaven. And I think some people think that's what Jesus has said and is saying. That you have to be like me. Look how wonderful I am. I'm all powerful and I'm great and I'm moral and I've never sinned. If you're like me, you get to go to heaven too. It's all about what you do. Kind of a, a, a salvation through a rescue and a reconciliation through our own strength and good works and, and willpower. And if you're not strong, you don't make it. It's like a survival of the fittest for eternity. It's a horrible thing. It's not democratic at all because it's not open to everyone. Only the strong survive. But instead... This triumphal entry and, and Holy Week and, and Good Friday, Easter, shows us that salvation is through weakness. Our reconciliation, our rescue, is possible because Jesus died on a cross. So that people, so that John Newton, so that you and I can have this free, amazing grace this free gift of grace, this rescue at Christ's expense I've talked about before, grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's rescue at Christ's expense. This free, amazing gift of grace, in spite of who we are, in spite of our flaws, in spite of our sins, those things that separate us from God, in spite of all of that, we get to get right with God through the humility of Jesus. It's just mind-blowing. They were heralding in and shouting and cheering for a king that they thought were going to overthrow the Romans and save them. And yet he was doing so much more than that. And it's available, it was available for everyone then, and it's available for everyone now. And it just throws our thinking a little bit. Now, I don't know if you noticed in the reading, we didn't just have the Palm Sunday part of the reading. We actually had the bit before, the evening before. And now that bit was... The celebration, it was a dinner in honour of Lazarus. A lot of commentators think who talk about the Bible and study the Bible, they think it was a, an evening celebration, a meal to celebrate Lazarus who was, had been raised from the dead. Now, I actually spoke about this last Easter Sunday and it's one of my favourite stories. But I love that they had a meal to celebrate that. Why wouldn't you? Someone's come back from the dead and they have this big feast to celebrate Lazarus rising from the dead. And to do that the night before um, the entry into Jerusalem and what became Jesus' final week on earth, so significant that Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, who's dead and came back to life. A transformation, not that different from John Newton's, from death to life in so many ways. And what I particularly love about the account in John there, where it talks about Mary and how she got this oil 
and she anointed Jesus' feet. Now we've seen this before in the Bible, other people who have, other women who have anointed Jesus' feet. And I, I think it's incredible that this happened the night before because I think again it speaks into something really special about when we see who Jesus really is. And so she got this, this pound, I don't know what that is in our, our money, in metric, <laughs> um, but she got a, a pound, that much pound, a pound or something, she got this pound of, of pure nard, really expensive stuff. And she takes it and she anoints the feet of Jesus and wipes his feet with her hair. I just want you to picture that for a moment. And it happened in the middle of this dinner. Now, usually guests did have their feet washed as they entered a house. It didn't usually happen in the middle of dinner. And usually the, the one who would wash the feet as, people, as guests entered the house was the lowest servant. And it's like Mary has recognised the humility. She takes on the place of the lowest to come and anoint Jesus. She recognises who Jesus is. And that he can transform her heart. I just, she's not looking for his strength or his power. She recognizes his peace and his grace. And she takes it and she was so humble. So humble. And so all of this, the celebration of Lazarus. Mary anointing feet, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem with palms and on the donkey. What does it mean for us? What does it tell us about us? What's the point for us this morning? What's our expectation of Jesus and of Easter? And so I want to ask you this question. What are you expecting this Easter? What are you expecting this week? What are you expecting of Jesus? You know, so often, like John Newton, we, we turn to God when things are really bad. You know, we've seen over this past year uh, with COVID-19 and all the, the difficulty that that's brought, that there's been an increase in searches online for, for God and church and prayer. When people, well, there's a desperation, there's a problem, and we often go to God when we've got a problem. It's kind of a natural default in us to, to go to something bigger than us when we're, we're scared and alone and we don't know what to do. And our problem is that we go to God thinking we know exactly what we need. A bit like those guys welcoming Jesus on Palm Sunday. They, they thought they needed a king. They thought they needed someone to bring judgment down on those who are ruining the world, the Romans those who were oppressing them. And they were like, here's the king. Here's the king. He's, he's going to bring judgment on them. He's going to save us. It's going to be great. Because he's, Jesus, you sort it out. You sort them out. You change it, change them. And how often do we do that? If we're honest, do we go to God and we say, Lord, would you sort that out? Lord, would you sort them out? Would you change it? Would you change them? And yet, Jesus is a God of transformation. And I think what he wants to say to us this morning is, I'll change you. I'll change you. The transformation of our hearts first and foremost. Because what we really need isn't for God to sort it or sort them. Our greatest need is to be reconciled to God, to be made right with him, for all the things that separate us from him, 
to be taken away. Another word for that is sin, to have our sins forgiven. Someone to bear the punishment for what we deserve. And I believe God wants to say something to us this morning. And a bit like in the psalm, search my heart, O God. Search my heart, O God. Where we, where I am crying out, God, I need you to fix this and I need you to sort that. Would you change this? And Jesus said, I'll, I'll change you. Start with me, my life transformed, my heart transformed. Because if Jesus showed up today, you know, and some of you want to end homelessness and end poverty and end the stress of finance and, and, and stress of kind of relationships and, and conflicts and all of those sorts of things. And God's saying, yeah, I can do that. I can come and save you from that, but I want to save you first. I want to rescue you. I want to reconcile you. I want to bring you salvation. This amazing free gift of grace. Because what he did that holy week was he sacrificed his life so that ours could be transformed by his amazing grace. And so I don't know what you think you need this Easter, what you're expecting God to do who or what you're expecting him to change. But let him start with us. Start with my heart. Start with your heart. I remember last year talking about Lazarus and his story uh, last Easter Sunday. And um, I used a phrase like when the stink hits the fan because when, when life is stinky, because Lazarus was wrapped up in those grave clothes and life was stinky, and Jesus said to Lazarus, come out, come out. I am the resurrection. The resurrection, what we're celebrating this week, Jesus coming back to life, is not an event. It's a person. And his name is Jesus. And he brings dead things back to life. He cleans us from the stink in our own hearts that we can be made right with God. He's a God of transformation. So expect that this Easter. Offer him your heart this Easter. That he might change us to make us more like him, to put us right with God, to become all that we were created to be without the sin that so easily entangles us without the stuff that hinders us and makes us trip and fall. Let's offer our hearts a bit like laying down those, those jackets. I can't because I'm clipped up, but <laughs> we can lay down our jackets like Stuart did at the beginning and like they did on that triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. Let's lay down some of the things that stop us from seeing who Jesus really is, why he really came and how he came. He didn't come in strength and force. He is strong, but not like that. Jesus is not going to hit you over the head and say you must sort this. He comes in humility. And so like Mary, we want to humble ourselves before him and anoint him this Easter. And I think then we'll see great things. Fix our eyes on him. Fix our eyes on him. Ask him to transform us and change us from the inside out. I love those verses from Hebrews 4 that Stuart read earlier. I want to encourage you to, to go back and ponder those as well. Really powerful. Jesus came in weakness and humility. And so we do the same. We say, God, I can't do this on my own. Why don't you pray with me this morning as we finish here? God, I can't do this on my own. I admit I need you.
Lord, we ask that this Holy Week, this Easter, you would bring transformation in our own hearts, in our lives first. Lord, that we might sing with, along with John Newton, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Father, I pray that we would see you so clearly this Easter. Not for who we think you are, but for who you really are. Lord, you touch us this morning in all our stink and in all our mess and in all our pain, in all our sin, all the stuff that separates us from you. Holy Spirit, come. Fill us afresh. Search my heart, O Lord. May we be transformed this Easter because of your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.